people of the Noongar Nation and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, just to also let members of the public gallery know, um, you're very welcome here tonight. Uh, we do live stream over the internet our meetings, but we don't live stream the public question time part and we don't have cam cameras um, filming this part, so, um, so just to let you know that. And we will begin live streaming after public question time. Just move to apologies and members on approved leave of absence. Um, we do have Councillor Gontoshevsky on leave at the moment. CEO, are you aware of any apologies from Councillor Buckles? Uh, no, I'm not, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Well, we'll expect to see Councillor Buckles shortly. Um, I'll now move to public question time. You're all very welcome to come to the microphone and address us. We're very interested in your views and we look forward to your feedback. Um, I do ask that when you come to the microphone you do state your name, your address and the item to which you're speaking to tonight and that you speak for three minutes uh, maximum. If you, at the end of your three minutes, haven't gotten through everything you wish to say, you're welcome to either hand us your notes or speak to me during the week or email us or alternatively you may wish to hand over to a friend or um, neighbour who's attended with you this evening. Okay, um, we're just moving to web streaming of the meeting. So if you're joining us on the web stream this evening, we welcome you to the meeting. We've just completed public question time and we're now moving on to declarations of interest. I'll hand over to the CEO. Thank you, Mayor Cole. We've received a number of disclosures of interest from council members this evening, the first being Councillor Jonathan Hallett in relation to item 5.1, the proposal at 44 Brisbane Street in Perth. It's a proximity interest disclosure from Councillor Hallett, uh, the extent of the interest being that he lives uh, directly across the road from the subject site. <coughs> Excuse me. The second disclosure of interest I've received is financial proximity interest from Councillor Joshua Tobelberg in relation to item 5.2, the proposal on Charles Street, North Perth. The nature of the interest being that um, the adjacent property at 560 Charles Street is owned and occupied by an immediate family member of Councillor Toppelberg's. And the third disclosure of financial interest I have received is from Councillor Jimmy Murphy in relation to both items 5.6 which is uh, the proposal for, uh, sorry, through you, Mayor Cole, I'll just clarify with Councillor Murphy my understanding. Oh, sorry. Item 5.6, the proposal for Newcastle Street, uh, Leaderville, and also item 5.11, uh, relocation of the Leaderville taxi rank. Um, the, the extent of Councillor Murphy's interest in these matters is that he received an election-related gift from Jason Anzac of the Leaderville Hotel during the 2015 ordinary local government election when Councillor Murphy was last elected to council. And he has also been engaged by Leaderville Connect to organise the 2017 Leaderville Carnival, which Leaderville Hotel may provide support or sponsorship of. Thank you, CEO. Um, we were just, has anyone heard from Councillor Buckles? You might have to assume that he's an apology for this evening, so we'll record him as such. Um, we'll now move through the items, and um, at this point, council members ask questions of administration. Um, I was going to move to the items that have been raised, but given that they are all planning items, I think it's probably just sensible to move through planning items in order, given that the majority have been raised by uh, members of the public this evening. So um, we'll start with uh, item number 5.1, which is a change of use from office to non-medical consulting room on, at 44 Brisbane Street, Perth. Do council members have any questions on this item? Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Director of Development Services, can I just clarify the cash in lieu condition that was on the previous approval um, that wasn't paid? Was it disputed by the applicant through that process or was it um, chased up by the city and it wasn't recovered for some reason? Uh, yes, through the Mayor. Um, my understanding is that the city followed it up and the applicant um, wasn't willing at that time to pay it and they wanted an applicate they, they therefore lodged an application for council to consider which is this application as part of this application they've requested the, the cash and lube be waived 
um, on further review, it's clear that the parking assessment that was undertaken as part of the previous application um, wasn't technically correct because it took in it didn't take into consideration the previous shortfall under the policy, um, which this now does. So the, the parking, the cash and lieu requirement is now slightly less. Um, so it partly addresses the applicant's concern. Any further questions on this one? Okay, let's move on to item 5.2, which is number 562 Charles Street, North Perth, proposed construction of five multiple dwellings. Do we have any questions on this item? Councillor Loden. Uh, three questions through to the Director of Development Services through the Chair. Um, Firstly, uh, the question raised from the gallery around it being three storeys and um, whether or not um, Council can consider the height of the um, item as a, a reason for refusal. The second one was the item raised, the suggestion that the time frame that this has been taken to Council and whether or not that can be considered by Council in this application. And the third one was um, a member raised the issue around uh, availability of parking in the area and if um, people, who, uh, people residing in this property in the future would be able to access uh, parking permits um, if there was ever traffic uh, parking restrictions brought in in that area. Um, through the Mayor, I'll try and go through them one by one. Um, in relation to the height, the deemed to comply height under the R codes for this area, which is R60, is, um, is four storeys. The city's built form policy um, has actually amended that to reduce it down to three storeys, um, but it is the deemed to comply height limit for the area, um, which this application complies with. So there is no discretion for council to exercise in relation to height. The height is deemed to comply um, and has already been reduced from the state government's um, four-storey limit for R60 areas. Um, the time frame is not a relevant consideration for Council. Um, the application must be considered on its merits, um, as in the, the planning merits of the proposal before you. Uh, in relation to the availability of parking, I just note that the application, again under the State Government's um, R codes, was required to have 1.25 visitor bays. Um, the applicants provided two visitor bays, so um, in excess of that number, but um, would be rounded up um, potentially. So um, they provided in excess of that number. That can't be amended by um, the local government without the state government's approval. So um, the, the parking that the applicant has exceeded that parking standard. Um, in relation to parking permits, it's unlikely that there would be um, parking restrictions in the area given it's um, fronting Charles Street. There's no access from Charles Street proposed. Um, it's unlikely there will be any parking on Charles Street. Um, however, as it's a multiple dwelling, if um, the applicant or the owners wanted to apply for parking permits, um, the city's current policy um, wouldn't allow them to be eligible for those parking permits. Um, so they would be required to contain their parking on site. Visitors will obviously be able to park within any parking restrictions that existed, um, but given there's two bays on site, it's, um, the city considers that there's adequate parking provided. Thank you. Um, Director, can I just clarify? My understanding of R60 was that the deemed to comply under the R codes is three storeys. I'll, I'll check that and we can... We can update that for you. Yeah. I mean, just to clarify, it doesn't have a bearing on the question because the development um, proposed development is three storeys, but if you could just clarify, that would be good. Thank you. Um, and while I'm asking a question, um, in relation to the landscaping, I just wanted to clarify whether the percentage of landscaping um, includes the road widening area and I also noted that there was um, what appears to be a green wall on the stairwell and I wanted to ask whether that's been considered as part of the landscaping calculation. Um, through the mayor, I have to take the question around the proportion of landscaping in the road widening on notice. Um, the, the green wall certainly hasn't been included in the calculation, though I'm certain of that. Thank you. Councillors, Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Director of Development Services. Um, just 
In regards to the vehicle entry and visitor bays being located on the right of way, um, are there any implications to the city in terms of maintenance or upgrades in the future beyond um, the condition that's been set for the applicant? Um, through the Mayor, no, I don't think there are any uh, implications for maintenance. The, the laneway was recently sealed, or not sealed, but um, recently replaced, um, and so the, the typical maintenance regime would apply um, with or without the access. Sorry, and just another one. Um, apologies to the councillors who have been here for longer than I have. Um, just wondering about the comment from the applicant in their letter around that they're not seeking design excellence on this project but had had design excellence previously. Could you just um, explain what that means? Apologies. Um, my understanding is that design excellence was granted um, before the application was lodged. There's been a lot of changes since that that application um, was lodged. The as a result of the community consultation um, and the feedback received from the community, the applicant has addressed a number of issues and the design has changed slightly. Um, in relation to the need for design excellence or otherwise. Um, the city's previous policy um, talked about design excellence being one of the criteria where additional height was um, requested um, or proposed. Um, in this case, additional height isn't proposed. Um, in addition, the city's, new, uh, the city's new policy doesn't reference design excellence and, and that process has fallen away. So um, that's potentially where it's come from. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Welcome, Councillor Buckles. I had I thought you were an apology, so I'll retract that and I'll welcome you to the meeting. Um, we're just up to item 5.2. Um, are there any further questions on this item? Okay, I'll move on to item 5.3, which is um, number 2, Coogee Street, Mount Hawthorne, proposed change of use from local shop residential to local shop eating house, including alterations and additions, amendment to approval. Are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Loden. Uh, through the Chair, on the um, conditions of approval for Saturday, it states uh, operating hours of 7 till 4 for the indoor area and 8 till 5 for the outdoor area. I'm just wondering if one or the other of them is a typo because you'd be able to arrive and might not be able to sit inside but would and then have to sit outside for the last hour that they're open. Um, through the mayor, I have the manager of approval services here, so I might um, pass to her to answer the questions in relation to this item. Um, through the mayor, in terms of the change in um, operating hours for outside, um, I will take that on notice and have a look at the applicant's proposal. Councillor Loden. Um, for the uh, also in terms of the parking survey work that was done, um, can we get a map or a diagram to show what the area of the survey was, um, and also did whether the city undertook any checks of their own on the the parking around that area? My understanding is it was uh, Britannia uh, wasn't didn't include Britannia, just looked at Coogee, Fairfield, and Hawthorne streets as well as Anzac. That's through the mayor uh, map can be provided and circulated to councillors with the briefing notes. Um, thank you. Through you, Mayor. Um, that was my question as well. Last time this came before us, we were able to get a very good oversight of um, the parking bays in surrounding streets as well as down at Britannia. So that, I think, would be useful to be consistent. Thank you. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Uh, on page 80 of the report, it says that in order to verify the applicant's uh, Parking survey administration undertook its own observations and lists a number of times. And it says, whilst percentages of occupancy haven't been calculated, it was found that adequate on-street parking was available. Um, is that data available? Was, it, is there, was the data actually taken? Because it seems odd that we took the data but didn't just look at the number of available bays and not provide that information if it was in theory to verify the accuracy of the applicant's information. 
um, through the Mayor, the data was collected. Um, most of it was photographic um, data for us to review in comparison to the data that was provided by the applicant. However, the calculations can be provided. Okay, sorry, and just thank you. And just um, further questions. So there's been, um, so obviously the, the reasons for refusal that were provided when the applicant initially appealed the condition, so it wasn't a separate application to increase the patron numbers, it was actually an appeal against the condition to limit them. Uh, first, is that, is that correct, that the application in May of last year was actually an appeal against the condition rather than a separate application to increase patron numbers? Um, through the chair, the, it was actually an application to increase patron numbers. So it was a, a fresh application um, for increase to patron numbers to 40. Um, the applicant had appealed council's refusal of that application, um, however, uh, to the State Administrative Tribunal. However, that appeal was later withdrawn by the applicant and did not proceed to a full hearing. Okay, so, so the. Okay, so it was an application for reconsideration of Condition 3.2 for the existing planning approval. So it was okay, um, which which is the same as what we are looking at currently, um, and obviously the reasons for refusal that are recorded uh, at the time are the reasons for refusal, and those are what's recorded and what's uh, defended. But at the time there was considerable uh, discussion that related to effectively the business not having operated prior to, and there was considerable discussion in the chamber. Is a question coming? It is. So it, absolutely it is. So I guess well, very much the question is in terms of, because not, none of the, the physical situation on the ground has changed in terms of the location or otherwise, in terms of the uh, those reasons, so the, and the officers go through each of those reasons uh, in, in, in the report that's presented, but in terms of, uh, from a, I suppose from a community perspective, in planning terms, how, 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 I'm just trying to think of the right way to ask it as a question too. Um, I guess without, without, that data, without that data being recorded or, or, or being uh, that information forming part of the reason for refusal, what is then the basis, if those conditions remain the same within the area, what is the basis for uh, then recommending or for arriving at an alternative decision when none of those physical circumstances have changed in terms of the surrounding amenity availability of parking, of parking provision of parking, etc. In planning terms, how do we come up with a, with, a, with a recommendation for approval given that those circumstances don't change? That was the art of asking a very long question. Well done, Councillor Toppelberg. Director. <laughs> Yes, um, through the Mayor. Um, there, are, there are a number of things that have changed. One is the information provided in relation to um, the immediate impact um, has increased. Now, that's increased partly because the business has been operating and it, we can actually um, go out and confirm that the applicant's modelling, acoustic modelling, um, and the impact on traffic, um, what it actually is. So that's, that's been the biggest change. Um, the applicants provided a lot of extra information around those issues which wasn't provided in the past in relation to the parking impact, the noise impact. Um, so they're probably the two biggest changes. Um, the other change is the number of patrons has reduced slightly. It is, it's not a significant reduction but then we're not talking about significant in, uh, you know, differences in numbers either. It's an increase of 20 patrons um, for an operation that has 15 plus a shop so um, proportionally, um, the reduction by five is, you know, not insignificant either. So they're the two changes that have um, led us to a different recommendation from last time. So just, so just to clarify, uh, is it then the so the first reason for refusal, which related to the car parking, is dealt with through the cash in the proposed cash in lieu, and the other three reasons that were the basis for refusal 12 months ago have been at have been able to be addressed or set aside because there's, it's the administration's view that there is evidence on the ground that those are no longer a concern? Is that the, the, the summary of where we're at? Yes, through the Mayor, that's, that's correct. It's, it's through. The other three conditions are through both the parking and the noise um, at issues being addressed by actually assessing what's on the ground and through the reports that have been provided with this application which weren't provided with the previous application. Through you, Mayor, um, to the Director. I just um, noticed on 
page, what I'm looking at is page 80, and it relates to Coogee Street and the classification of Coogee and Anzac, Anzac Road being a B distributor, which can take up to 6,000 vehicles a day, and Coogee Street, which can take up to 3,000 vehicles a day. Um, my question is, the last traffic count was done in August 2016. Is there any more recent data to show whether the vehicle movements have increased from 891? And my second question is, have there been any substantiated noise complaints? Uh, through the chair, um, we, no, that's the most recent traffic data is 2016. We haven't taken any more traffic data since that period. And through the mean in relation to the noise, we'll have to take that on notice. Um, we need to go and check the files to make sure that there's been none. We're not aware of any, but we'll go back and check. Yep. Can I just follow up on that? Are you saying that you're not aware of noise complaints or you're not aware of verified noise complaints? Yeah, so through the mean, the substantiated, yeah, the, substantiated, the substantiated noise Substantiated, OK. Thank you. Councillor Harley, did you have further questions? Councillor Loden? Uh, just on that same topic of noise, one of the concerns that's been raised is around the delivery and the noises during del when deliveries are made. And to my understanding, this is managed through the, the management plan. If there is a, uh, a breach of that management plan, what powers does the city have to take action? Um, through the Mayor, um, it's a, a condition of planning approval. So if there was um, a substantiated breach, the city could issue an infringement in relation to the matter. Um, we would look at working with the applicant or the operator to ensure that they're fully aware of their obligations of the management plan and um, ensure that they're working um, within the bounds of that management plan. Councillor Buckles. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, through you to the, uh, the, the Director of Development Services slightly, just in terms of the noise management plan, I just I, I don't think we've got a copy of the plan itself. Um, does it, I know it restricts use of the outside area until nine o'clock, but would they, are they still able to set up? I get the feeling that it's the setup that is particularly noisy in terms of dragging furniture, a couple of complaints. So will they be restricted from setting up until nine o'clock or will they set up at seven and then and then, um, and then have them empty for two hours. Uh, through the mayor, um, it, that's that's a good point, and we'll sit down and and take take that question on notice. We'll review the full noise management plan again um, to make sure that the setup is picked up um, and that the operating hours reflect that. Another but unrelated question. Um, I just noted that when we previously approved this, um, we allowed a reduced level of parking requirement. Cash in lieu than would normally, I think it was 4.56, were required, and we allowed cash in lieu to be only paid on 2.72, on, on two and a bit. And now they're more than doubling their patrons, but we're only requiring 2.72. Have we applied a reduced cash in lieu rate as per the initial? application or is that just because we require less cash in lieu as numbers get bigger? Um, through the chair, the cash in lieu payable for this application is uh, proportionate to the increase in patron numbers um, and therefore um, that's what it considers. Yeah, no, no, I, know it's, I know it's an increase in patron numbers but previously they had required 4.56 bays and we only made them pay cash in lieu for two point something. And we seem to be more than doubling the number of patrons, but we're only doubling the cash in lieu related to the reduced cash in lieu rate that we applied earlier, which was for, because it's only a 2.72 increased shortfall going from 15 to 35, but the shortfall at 15 was 4.56. So I'm not sure whether, I think I'd certainly, if we could take our notice, have a look at that, I'd prefer that if we were going to re give them reduced cash in lieu, that was a de decision of council rather than an assumed increase from the previous. So I just don't know whether it's for the first 10, we have a certain number and then it's increased. So if we just get that checked, it's not. Yeah. Um, through the mayor, I can provide an update. In terms of the previous calculation, it would have factored in the shop as well as the eating house. And this application only relates to the increase in the eating house component, the, the cafe. 
Any further questions? Okay, I, I do have a few. Um, also, just this is just an administrative matter, but I noted that in the report it talked about the plans being marked yellow and green to denote the two separate um, outdoor eating areas, and um, I think that we just got the grayscale version, so if you could potentially upgrade that for the council meeting, that would be helpful. Um, I do have some questions about noise. I wanted to ask that in the in the report it talks about potentially affected noise sensitive premises and um, I just wanted to, I, I guess this will probably come come through, but I'd be interested to note given that they've been identified as, as the most um, potentially noise affected, have each of those particular households provided um, a comment and was that comment in support or an objection? There were eight properties noted. Um, and also from a noise perspective, I note that the report talks about 35 patrons, which is, is not what is proposed under the recommendation, but regardless in the report it talks about 35 patrons in the outdoor um, eating area, which is on site, would produce decibels between the range of 25 to 47. And then it also talks about six patrons in the curbside um, Al fresco would produce similar in and the range is 22 to 43 decibels and I'm just wondering whether there should be consideration given to having all external um, patrons only on the on site that's actually blue and green thank you CEO I'm talking yellow and green <laughs> um, yeah the, I'm talking yeah whether it would actually be um, have less of a noise impact to not use the curbside al fresco and to instead have all diners in the on-site um, outdoor al fresco, given that the noise generation between 35 in one space and 6 in the other is similar. If we could please look into that. Um, I also just wanted to ask um, in relation to probably our most similar um, like um, for like and looking at Hobart Street Deli if you could please just advise in the briefing notes the zoning of Hobart Street Deli patron numbers for both inside and outside and whether there's been um, noise and parking complaints um, that's probably slightly different in that you'd have a lot of parking generated from Hobart Street Deli but nonetheless that would be useful information to have um, and I also just wanted to ask some questions about is the current curbside outdoor eating use eating area being used and what are the current delivery times and also whether there's an intention to play um, to play amplified music happy to have those taken on notice if you wish but there are members of the public here who are interested if you have responses to any of those questions Um, through the Mayor, in terms of um, the questions, I've only got a response in relation to the curbside um, delivery, sorry, the, the deliveries and the delivery timeframes. Um, under the uh, noise regulations, deliveries can't be received prior to 7am, and so the applicants are uh, receiving deliveries after 7am. With the remaining questions, I'll take them on notice. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Councillor Toppelberg. So just one final question. There was some concern raised about uh, the potential for change of ownership or otherwise, or um, that the uh, approval would potentially ca carry to another, uh, another business, even if the current operators were, uh, uh, keen, well, um, were to comply with what, what's proposed uh, from the, the staff. Um, can you just confirm if it is possible to tie any approval to the, uh, the business itself and to the current owners or to the current proposal? Um, through the Mayor, yes, that's been done previously by Council, so um, that is an option for Council to consider and um, we'll take that on notice and review. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to item 5.4, which is Number eight, Gibney Avenue, Mount Hawthorne, nine multiple dwellings. Are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Hallett. Um, slightly goes a bit general beyond just this um, particular one, but 
the site was demolished um, over a year ago, and I'm just wondering about what parameters we have to, I guess, prevent demolitions occurring quite far out from when ac applications are actually approved. Um, through the Mayor, in terms of um, demolition applications, with the changes to the um, planning and development regulations, there's an exemption um, from the need to link a development approval with a demolition. Um, and since the introduction of that exemption, um, a single house uh, or any outbuildings associated with a single house can actually be demolished without the need uh, for obtaining planning approval. Any further questions, Councillor Hallett? Councillor Loden? Uh, just a quick one in regards to the question raised from the floor about um, a three-storey versus a two-storey development um, through the Director of Development Services, just to clarify what is the uh, maximum height allowed in this area. Um, through the Mayor, the subject property is, um, has a, a deemed to comply height limit of three storeys. Excuse me, just again, I thought this was an R80 zoning, which would be four storeys. Um, through the Chair, the City's built form policy identifies this area um, as a three storey height limit, which replaces the deemed to comply requirements of the codes. Thank you. Any further questions on this one? Um, look, I just do want to ask about the um, boundary setbacks because there are quite a few um, variations and I just wanted to ask if you could talk through the rationale about those um, re reduced boundary setbacks um, not adding to bulk and density and privacy or overlooking which has been expressed as concerns by the neighbouring residents. Is that something you could please address? Thank you. Um, through the Mayor, yes, in terms of um, bulk and uh, scale and privacy, in terms of privacy, the openings that are located along um, those boundaries are actually compliant as minor openings, and so there's no direct privacy um, resultant from those um, openings directly into the adjoining properties. Um, the balconies at the upper floors are provided with screening. Um, those screening devices actually meet the deemed to comply requirements of the codes. They also add some articulation um, to the massing of, along that section of wall, both on the east and western boundaries. Um, so they provide a breakdown of materials um, and a different um, uh, finish uh, along that section, which assists in, in breaking down the, the massing along that side. There are also uh, varying setbacks along both the eastern and western boundaries, which assist in um, sort of redirecting or minimising that, um, that bulk as well. And just further to that, I note that one of the recommendations was to remove the um, screening of the balconies, but that that is north facing towards the high density area of RAC2. Is that correct? Is there any anywhere within the, the visual cone of vision that impacts on the neighbouring properties, or is it all towards the, the north and the high zoning? Um, through the Mayor, the majority of the overlooking resulting from those rear balconies does project into the properties along Scarborough Beach Road. Um, there is a small corner of both of the adjoining sites. Um, it's the most immediate far corner. Um, you can see it on page um, 144. Um, however, it's a really quite small projection um, and it's, the administration considers that the impact um, caused by that overlooking is minimal. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Okay, thank you for that. We'll move on to item 5.5, which is number 44, Cadinus Street, North Perth, proposed outbuilding to single house. Are there any questions on this item? Councillor Hallett. Through the Mayor to um, Development Services Director. Can I just confirm, um, had there been less complaints, this would have been just approved through admin um, without coming to council. Um, and can I just check then what was the process from the end of the consultation period as to the time delay between then and um, it coming to council now? Um, through the Mayor, yes. If, because the applications received um, five or more objections um, under the city's delegations, it's required to be presented to council. Um, 
I can't comment on the exact details of what's happened since um, it's been advertised, but I can provide that in the briefing notes um, and set that out. Uh, any further questions? Um, just to follow up on that, my understanding is that it's come to council because of the fact there are two outhouses that collectively go above the 60 square metres. Is that correct, Director? Um, through the Mayor, no, that, that discretion is something that um, if there was less than five objections, um, administration would have delegation to determine, yes. Um, but I do note that it still wouldn't meet the 10% um, overall site, at, because given the size of the lot. Yes, through the Mayor, that's correct. If um, the applicant had met the, the requirements of the R codes in relation to the site area, um, then it would be deemed to comply um, and wouldn't, be requ wouldn't require a DA at all. It would just simply go through as a building permit. Okay, and also just some of the comments raised um, from neighbouring residents raised issues of um, storing materials and vehicles of a commercial nature. Can you just advise what would happen if that was to be the case? Yes, um, through the Mayor, I think it's condition two, um, sets out that it's required to be used in accordance with the definition of an outbuilding um, under the R codes, so it couldn't be used for um, commercial purposes of storing motor vehicles and repairing motor vehicles, etc. Thank you. Um, would it be possible, just for ease of reference, to include the definition in the report? That would that would be handy. Thanks. Yes, okay. certainly. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, we're moving on to item 5.6, which is um, 742 Newcastle Street, Leederville, proposed amendment to first floor trading hours of previous appro approval. Um, Councillor Murphy's just leaving the room, so we'll allow him to do that, and then we'll move to questions. Are there any questions on this item, councillors? Councillor Toppelberg. Um, just in relation, so there were some questions asked from, um, I think it was Amanda, who's an occupant at 297 Vincent Street, uh, which was approved on February 22nd, 2012, um, leaving the section 70A Condition 7.2.1 in relation to noise and amenity uh, on the title of that property to the side. Condition 7.5 of that development required an acoustic report, so I'm just in part curious where you have an, uh, an approval for a, uh, a property that, or a mixed use development including multiple dwellings which back onto what is an established uh, live music venue and hotel and they're required to submit an acoustic report whilst there are the noise regulations that exist uh, under the Health Act. Can you give some, uh, just some comment in relation to the obligations of 297 Vincent Street and the acoustic report and their construction and what amenity considerations they would have been required to provide to their occupiers? Um, yes, through the Mayor, there was a condition on that, um, that approval for 297 Vincent Street. Um, the city's policy at the time um, is different to the city's policy now, which um, in relation to low frequency noise, so base, basically. Um, so the applicant complied with those requirements at the time um, and the policy that existed when the planning approval was issued, so they did comply with that condition um, and they did have an oblig obligation to ensure that the noise um, that was entering the rooms and the residents at, as part of that apartment development um, met the requirements of the city's policy, which, um, which it did, um, and they went through that process. The, um, that does not change, as you stated, the requirements under the noise, um, the noise regulations, which still apply, um, you know, despite any planning conditions that attempt to try and minimise the impact of noise on, on surrounding neighbours. And in terms of our standard condition that we apply, which is a section 70A, which is a notice on title that uh, um, occupancy of the property you know, that may be impacted by uh, uh, issues like noise, car parking, etc., from surrounding, I think it says surrounding residential and non-residential users. Um, I know that in specific circumstances, like the corner of Fitzgerald and Angove, the condition is specifically mentioned uh, potential noise from live and amplified music. But just in relation to the general condition, which says that you may be, your amenity may be impacted, uh, has that ever been tested? I, I'm, I'm, 
it's, it doesn't directly relate to the application, but just more so in terms of I understand the city's working closely with um, with uh, Amanda Hicks in terms of uh, trying to reach reasonable outcomes, but just in terms of what obligation or what, what is the reasonable expectation in terms of those conditions and has that ever been tested because it does seem as a condition seems to be ambiguous and be rather subjective? Yes, through through the Mayor. That notification that was applied to the, um, the apartment development and many other apartment developments throughout the city is is just a notification. So it's a notification for all the owners that they may be subject to um, noise from live music venues or road, um, you know, major road distributors. So it's not, um, it, it doesn't do anything more than notify the owners. Um, and so it, it hasn't been, there hasn't been a need to test it because it's just a notification. Any okay, further just, questions? Yeah, sorry, yes, you're still going? Further, so yeah, so um, there was a, a suggestion from a uh, concerned uh, neighbour and business owner in the area who owns and operates a venue that is open until uh, the wee hours as well to, um, uh, to potentially look at uh, a trial period or time limited approval. Is that something that the administration has considered or would consider? Uh, and also, uh, what are the implications then in relation to uh, liquor licensing if there was a time limited approval on the uh, the DA? I'm not familiar with it. RGL would, would ever issue a time limited uh, license or approval of, of that nature, obviously extraordinary licenses for specific time, but if you can provide some comment around whether that is something that has been considered or is a possibility. Yes, through the Mayor. Um, the two issues are very separate, the, the liquor licensing and whether um, Department of Racing, Gaming and Liquor um, chooses to um, approve a liquor licence until 3am is very different to the planning application, which is being assessed on the planning issues. Um, whether DRGL would be willing to um, consider a time limited approval, um, I'm not sure. I'll have to take that on notice and provide that in the briefing notes. The city did consider a time limited approval, but given um, the acoustic report clearly demonstrated that the, um, the use of the Bushka Bar could comply um, reasonably with the, with the noise regulations. Um, and given the staggering of the closing times for the hotel um, was considered to be a potentially a positive outcome if it was managed correctly through the DRGL approval, um, it was considered to be appropriate. So we did consider it, but um, we didn't think it was um, necessary. I'll provide some more information on DRGL's process and whether they'd consider um, whether they have considered time limited approvals in the past. Any further questions? Um, Jonathan, yes. Sorry, Councillor Hallett. <laughs> um, through you, Mayor, to I think the Director of Community Engagement, probably. Um, do we have any data on alcohol fueled violence in the area of Leaderville and um, times and locations, and that kind of thing? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the WA Police does provide the city with uh, data suburb by suburb. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be restricted to particular venues, but uh, that is distributed to councillors on a semi-regular basis as, as we receive it from WA Police, so I'm happy to provide the most recent data in the briefing notes. Thank you, Director. Um, I do have a few questions just in relation to um, the issues raised tonight from the gallery um, in relation to um, the nearby resident Amanda Hicks raised issues of noise complaints and just similar to a previous question on previous item, um, could we have some information on whether we have substantiated noise complaints um, in relation to the Leadville Hotel? Um, Secondly, there was the point made about nightclub versus extension of hotel hours, with nightclubs traditionally being late night venues and hotels not so. Um, could you provide some commentary on whether this is um, effectively a hotel um, morphing into a nightclub use and whether this is um, appropriate and whether it's standard to approve extension of hours to three for hotels? Just general information would be useful on that. Um, there was also the question about whether a planning approval could condition the type of entertainment that's proposed for the Babushka Bar. Um, there has been um, there has been 
talk from the Leaderville Hotel about this being a late night supper club, jazz music, etc. And um, my concern is that once that's approved, it's approved. And in terms of the actual entertainment, would that be a valid planning condition to include? Um, and there was also the question around the liquor licence process and whether the police recommendations to G DRGL would be made public, which could come through the information that you've already mentioned that you make available, um, and whether there'll be further consultation with um, other leadable businesses and residents through that liquor licensing process. Um, yes, through the Mayor, uh, the City, it's hard to say whether the City has substantiated noise complaints. We've certainly been to um, the, the, the residents' um, property and observed um, noise levels. We have not um, been able or been successful in recording noise levels that breach um, the regulations because we had bad weather on one night, but we certainly have been there to observe the noise um, and further investigation is, is warranted. So um, the complaints um, you know, are worthy of further investigation. Um, in relation to uh, the land use, um, this ho the hotel has been operating for a very long time. Um, the land use, the existing land use that it's approved at is hotel, um, based on a, a very, um, sorry, on a previous definition of hotel. Um, the proposal before us is not proposing to change the land use, just proposing to extend the operating hours of the existing use. Um, but it, it is noted, and it's noted in the report, that the city's policy um, in relation to noise um, sets some guidelines around noise in town centre, around, um, not, sorry, the city's policy in relation to, to licensed premises, not noise, um, provides some guidelines around the operating hours of um, nightclubs and hotels um, and other land uses, um, and states that nightclubs, um, as the guideline, could operate till 3 a.m. Um, and hotels till 1 a.m. Um, so, given this proposal is for uh, an area that is um, inside a building, and we don't consider, or we consider that the noise can be contained, um, and that the staggering of the closing times um, would lead to a better outcome for um, the area. Um, it was considered appropriate for the operating hours to remain until 3 a.m. for this hotel. Um, but it is, um, it's not strictly in accordance with the policy's guidelines. They're not strict um, requirements, but they are um, some, some guiding time frames. Um, in relation to restricting the land use, I think that given what the applicant has proposed and given the land use is a hotel, it would be a, a, a reasonable or, and a valid consideration for council to look at uh, limiting the use of that space. Um, so that's something I can provide through in the briefing notes and we'll review in more detail. Um, and finally, in relation to DRGL, my understanding is that it will be advertised to the public um, if a, a liquor licence application is um, put through and the surrounding um, Area will have an or the community, sorry, the surrounding community will have an opportunity to comment. But again, I'll, I'll explain that um, in detail in the briefing notes. Thank you, Director. Are there any further questions? Okay, we'll move on. Um, moving on to 5.7, which is number 84 to 92, Parry Street, Perth, proposed change, change of use from showroom and office to place of worship and office. Are there any questions on this item? Councillor Loden. Uh, one of the questions raised from the gallery was around explaining uh, the interactive, what an interactive street front is. If uh, the director could uh, provide an explanation, that'd be great. Um, through the mayor, the application um, proposes office uses um, fronting Parry Street. Um, the purpose of the condition is to ensure that during hours of operation, there is some uh, activity or at least some visibility from within the building um, out to the street. Uh, just a second question. Uh, one of the other questions raised was around uh, security in the community, particularly during operation on a Sunday, uh, the Sunday morning hours. Um, 
Is there any um, steps that the City of Vincent takes around addressing security? Um, through the Mayor, we'll, we'll take that on notice um, and speak to the applicant about their proposed um, security measures and how they propose to manage um, you know, the operations in, in detail. Any further questions? Um, can I be a little bit sneaky and state that I forgot to ask a question in re relation to Gibney Avenue, which I think was a valid question. If you wouldn't mind noting it down, it was from a member of the public gallery about the location of the bin store across from his son's bedroom. I think that was a question that we definitely need to answer. Oh, you wish to answer it now? I think the gentleman's left now. Oh. But go ahead, put um, on the public record. Um, through the Mayor, the bin enclosure um, or the location of the bin store is actually a fully enclosed building with walls and a roof. So in terms of odours, um, they will. Uh, it's not as if it's an open-sided structure, um, so those odours will be managed um, in terms of the ability to clean um, that, that storage space. And just to add, we'll, we'll contact um, the resident tomorrow and let them, or this week, and we'll let them know um, that detail and, and have a discussion with them about their concerns. Thank you. It would probably be good to identify the entry point into the bin store area and where that is in, in location of the window. Thank you for that. Okay, um, we're moving on to item 5.8, which is number 233 Charles Street, North Perth, five um, group dwellings. Councillor Loden. Uh, just a minor question. Um, this uh, development has 12% deep soil zones and 29.7% um, tree canopy coverage. So my interpretation is that that would not comply technically even though it's quite close. Is, is that correct? Um, through the Mayor, yes, it, it won't comply with the landscaping provisions once they're adopted, or if they're adopted by the Commission as they are, but it certainly complies with the, the current deemed to comply requirements under the R codes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I did ask this question today of the Director of Development Services, but um, I will ask again. Can you just give some commentary, please, as to, uh, well, I understand the state amended planning framework, design WA, etc., doesn't actually uh, this wouldn't be caught uh, um, by uh, that, that planned policy. Uh, there's no requirement for it to be re uh, presented to our DAC. Um, I'll leave the design outcome as something subjective, but are you able to provide some comment around our built form policy and some of the uh, potential uh, challenges or possible future amendments that we could utilise in order to get perhaps a... Uh, less plain outcome for developments of this nature? Um, through the Mayor, I've just noticed that the, the plans that are in front of you at the moment are the old plans, they're not the current plans. So um, we, that we will, look forward to seeing the... That will need to be updated. dramatically more beautiful? <laughs> there certainly is a lot of, a lot of um, difference in the presentation to the street. Um, we worked hard with the applicant um, towards the end of this process to address those, those issues that the city had. Um, in relation to the question, there is um, the, the R codes are split into two parts. Um, one part deals with group dwellings and single houses and the other part deals with um, mixed use developments and multiple dwellings. Um, the city's policy is limited in the scope of the R codes and where we can amend and um, add things. Um, without the need for the, the Commission's approval. So um, we are limited in, in that area. In relation to group dwellings, we're even further limited because the scope in relation to apartments and commercial buildings um, is far greater than it is for single houses and group dwellings, um, for obvious reasons. Um, the, so the city's policy has um, attempted to push um, the quality of developments as far as it can within the scope of the R codes. Design WA has helped in that process um, because it, it does the same thing. And so the city's built form policy aligns with the state government's new draft policy, which is also doing um, similar things. And um, we do some things better. And I think Design WA does things better. And, um, and we, uh, once 
the R codes are updated, we will be able, with Design WA becoming part of them, we will be able to do all of the things that um, we need to to improve the quality of development in the city. Um, the issue with Design WA is it doesn't apply to group dwellings, so it doesn't give us the same um, ability to influence the design outcome and require more positive design outcomes. So um, that is something that the state government is working on as their next stage once Design WA is, um, is addressed. So in the meantime, um, as part of the subsequent review we'll do of the built form policy, the city will be pushing, again, leading the industry and pushing um, those standards for group dwellings um, ahead of the state government, just like we did with the built form policy. So just one further question. Uh, number, the city at some point, I think prior to your arrival, uh, approved unrendered maxi bricks uh, as part of a street fence fund at number 12A Raglan Road in Mount Lawley. Uh, and I noticed in this application that we are uh, promised the joy of feature face brick uh, as part of... Uh, can we get just some clarity around what feature face brick will actually mean before we have to put our hands in the air for this development, please? Yes, through the Mayor. Um, the, the, all of that detail has been provided with the amended plan, so you will have that um, in the pack and in the um, report that comes out on Friday. I apologise for the, the plans being um, outdated with that detail. Any further questions in relation to this item? OK, we'll move on to uh, item 5.9, review of policy number 4.2.13, Design Advisory Committee. Any questions? OK, no, we'll move on. Um, we don't have the late report at this time, which is item 5.10, Fencing Local Law 2008, but I understand that that will be made available um, with the Council agenda to come out on Friday. Do you still wish to ask a question, Councillor Toppleberg? It arrived at about 5.30pm, so we did, get oh, we, did? It. we did get it eventually. No, no, that, that was to oh, advise no? that it wouldn't be available until, okay. until the agenda comes out on Friday. Would anyone like to um, well, you know, put your questions in writing if you have questions? Um, in relation to 5.11, a late report on the relocation of the Leaderville Town Centre Taxi Zone. Questions, please. Councillor Loden. Uh, this is a question I was already put in email to the director, but just uh, to reiterate. So, uh, just to clarify that there is inclusion of a um, an acrod bay as part of the um, the redistribution and parking and the and the taxi rank. Is that correct? Uh, yes, through the mayor, um, we have oh, and, and Craig has had a had a detailed look at this, and um, we can provide an acrod bay. Um, a, a varied version, but an acro bay can be provided um, with some line marking. I think it's the end bay of the current taxi zone. The most um, eastern, is it? The most eastern one. Yep. Through you, Chair. Yep. Um, through to the Director. I'm just um, wanting to find out about any monitoring activities by the City over the last few weeks. I've sent in a couple um, a couple more emails um, and have been down there regularly on Friday and Saturday nights over the last um, four or five weeks and just wanting to know what you've seen through the monitoring activity. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, rangers have been on site over the last couple of months. Uh, in the last month they've issued 44 infringements, uh, primarily to uh, taxis as well as uh, a couple of Uber and, and chauffeur drivers. Uh, what has been uh, monitored is, is basic misuse of the, of the taxi zone itself whereby uh, drivers are leaving the vehicles uh, which is then causing banking up of the taxis along Newcastle and up Oxford Street. So rangers have uh, attempted to speak to taxi drivers which hasn't proven all that successful. Uh, hence they started issuing infringements um, because of uh, some of the reactions they were receiving from taxi, taxi drivers. Some of the infringements were also issued uh, based upon um, photographic evidence, um, which, which is uh, permissible. Uh, and on the back of uh, having to take those enforcement actions, administration has indeed met with representatives from uh, a couple of the major taxi companies to try and get uh, their behaviour on board from a traffic or a, a taxi company perspective rather than relying upon the behaviour of individual taxi drivers. 
Thank you, um, Director. And what has been the uh, response of some of those uh, companies? That's my first question about that. And have you also noted with the um, Uber, the Deliveroo, what else gets delivered now, picked up? Have you been able to engage with any of those providers as well? I ask that because I've noted that they're stopping in loading zones, bus stops, in the middle of the road, on the footpaths, and I've taken photos of it as well, and I'll send some more through if you like. Um, yes, through the Mayor. In relation to the, the taxi companies, um, we, we did have a very pos some very positive meetings with, with the taxi companies that were representing mm -hmm. some of the taxi drivers, um, and that's an ongoing challenge for them. Um, but we will continue to work with them. I think um, it's, it's good that we've been able to build this relationship and hopefully from here we'll be able to work with them to address some of these issues. It's another avenue for us to address them anyway. Um, so that those meetings have been positive. In relation to Uber Eats, um, and Deliveroo and, and other such um, services, this proposal isn't uh, or doesn't propose to address that issue. That is a, an ongoing challenge and it's something that we're, we're grappling with at the moment. There is certainly a number of opportunities for um, those services to use um, you know, parking bays legally within the town centre. Um, so it's, a, it's really a matter of um, the city coming up with the strategy to ensure enforcement and working with, again, with Uber and Deliveroo to understand if there are any things that they, um, they need to ensure that they can deliver those services. Um, that we can we can support them with, but um, it Fighting is separate. At Bays or down Oxford Street. Can I ask whether Swan Taxis or any of the other companies have offered, or are you aware of whether they've actually come on site, particularly on Friday and Saturday nights, to observe for themselves what is happening to that intersection? Um, through the mayor. I'm not aware that they've been to this site on a Friday night. They certainly have been to some other sites, and they mentioned in, in the meeting um, that they, have, they share our concerns with, with the driver behaviour. So they do understand, and they are working to try and address it. Um, but that's not going to remove the compliance, the need for us to undertake the compliance, the proactive compliance that we, we are at the moment. Councillors? Um, Director, I would like to ask a question in relation to the hours of the um, taxi zone and drop-off um, points being from 8pm. I just wondered whether that was on the basis of feedback from stakeholders that has taken place already or whether that was a, a bit of a guesstimate about when action starts to happen with taxis and Ubers in Leederville. Um yeah, my, my understanding was it, it was a result of conversations, but I'm not sure whether the exact time came from those discussions. So I'll take that on notice and provide that information in the pack. Thank you. Um, also, just has there been any concern from um, stakeholders or from staff about whether the three remaining bays, I think it would be helped a lot if one is an ACROD bay, but if we had two... The, the two bays plus an ACROD, is there any um, concern that it will still be used by taxis given that it's close to the original location and how can we, is that just going to be a matter of range of presence or how can we deal with that? Um, yes, through you Mayor, the, there is concern that the, the taxis could park in, in those bays, um, however they would still be bound by the existing parking restrictions. So, sorry, the parking restrictions that will be there, so the one-hour parking restriction. Um, and it's highly likely that, given the demand for parking in the Leaderville Town Centre, that those bays will be used um, by patrons of and, and people visiting the Leaderville Town Centre. And so um, we think that the issue will be addressed by the fact that the bays are, will be in high demand and will be used. Um, however, that's, that's part of the reason why a trial is being proposed, so that we can understand whether what we're proposing to do in this space is going to effectively move the taxis further down uh, Newcastle Street. Any further questions on this item? Uh, that means we've officially finished the grilling on planning items and we're moving on now to technical services. So do we have any um, questions in relation to 6.1, which is about a replacement of the electric bike for the bike library? Councillor Toppelberg. OK, 
Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Director of Te Acting Director of Technical Services. Um, just wondering if it's possible on notice to get the numbers for, of individual hires on previous years. Um, the report states that there were 57 um, individual hires in 2016. Um, and just wanting to know about kind of the extent to which, if any, all bikes are taken out at the same time. Um, and then also the extent to which we promote the availability of the service more broadly within the Vincent community. Uh, through the Mayor, I'll certainly try and uh, well, we'll get that information for you. And, se and the second part of the question, how it's advertised, but the majority of it's through our website and uh, active transport options and um, through the various community groups. Um, I do have a question just in relation to the mayoral vehicle, the electric bike. Um, which um, I'm not able to use given that it's sized for a giant. Um, so my understanding was that that had gone into the general pool and that we do have a surp that is effectively a surplus electric bike and I'm just wondering how that is being treated in the, um, in the general pool of staff bikes versus potential for use in the electric... In the, in the um, bike library, also recognising that it is a large size and it wouldn't suit everybody, but can, can we get um, some information about how that is being used because effectively it is not being used as a, mer a mayoral vehicle? Uh, through the Mayor, yes, I'll definitely um, find the information as well. Uh, I know we've had a lot of discussion about your preference to use or not to use it because of the size of it, so I'll, I'll speak to the Travel Smart Officer and get some data on it. Um, it's not just a preference, a Travel Smart um, Officer has advised against, um, <laughs> probably for safety reasons. <laughs> Thank you, Director. Um, any further questions on this item? Okay, moving on to the tenders. Um, the first tender is for provision of small maintenance services. Any questions on this item? Councillor Buckles? I, I just wanted to ask, I know it's confidential because I won't, I won't discuss the dollar amounts in the confidential attachment, but six hundred and eight thousand dollars a year for for this contracted existing tender at the hourly rate appears to be about one thousand three hundred and seventy five days at eight hours a day for the year. So I was wondering if we could just check that that was accurate. Because that is a, I mean that's you know approximately eight or so full time wages for a handyman, maybe six. It just seems like an awful lot of money that we're spending on that particular contract. I'm not surprised it's an incumbent that they went in as the cheapest. Uh, through the Mayor, I'll certainly check that out, but obviously that includes all the materials and everything else that's associated with the project. Oh, okay, so, so in, the, in, the, sorry, in the confidential annex, that is just the hourly rate, and then there are other clauses about the add-on costs and the like. Okay, okay, it was just because the, the attachment really just lists the hourly rate, so I wasn't sure if this was purely an hourly rate. And then, you know, my assumption was that if they were doing jobs, then the materials would be in addition to that. But, but that does explain why it's $608,000 then. Through you, Mayor. Um, um, to you, Acting Director, are you able to let us know <clears throat> what the previous annual spend was on small maintenance jobs? I've asked quite a lot of questions about this over the last couple of years, so I would be interested to see the 15, 16, 14, 15 amounts and to have any explanation for variances. And I ask that because I thought the last time this came to Council it was about $250,000 per annum. So if, if you could provide that in advance of the meeting, unless you already can answer that this evening. Thanks. Now, through the mayor, I'll take it on notice. Councillor Lowden. Um, Councillor Harley, would you mind swapping out for one second? Thank you. Uh, through, through the chair to Director of uh, Corporate Services. Um, in terms of process around um, assessing a tender, um, if the evaluation picks one as the preferred item, so in this case it's 3.82 points higher than the other, can the tenderers decide to pick one of the other options if they so wish? And if so, how would they go about doing that? 
uh, through the chair um, in terms of the evaluation process so under the regulations we are required to establish the criteria that a tender will be ass will be assessed on and assess it on that criteria and that criteria only um, what that does is delivers a, a score in terms of um, you know a weighted average uh, of what what the scores would be for each of those tenders um, so that is the the qualitative um, part of the assessment and then the regulations provide that the council is to appoint the tenderer that um, the, the most advantageous tenderer so there is an opportunity to um, consider virtually a, a value for money assessment so but again, you need to be very careful and be able to justify why you'd vary from um, an assessment process that delivered, um, a, you know, a balanced criteria um, against a judgment thereafter. But it is possible if you had a score scores that were very close, but financially there's a significant difference between the two. Um, you may consider that that is a more advantageous result for the organisation, but um, you'd need to be able to just demonstrate how that would deliver and how that is more advantageous than the criteria was designed to deliver in the first place. Councillor Lowden. So I guess following up to maybe use this as an example, um, the option selected is not the lowest cost option um, and hypothetically if one of the other options was 10% cheaper although with your recent comments about cost of materials it's probably invalid but if it was 10% cheaper that might be about a 60 grand saving to the city a year would you you could then assess that saving whatever that amount was against the other criteria and say that those criteria would fulfill the needs of what we wanted the city to do, but um, and therefore we would take the benefit of that reduced cost. Would that be a way you could do that? It is permissible. So the the regulations do provide, as I said, it it establishes that you <laughs> appoint the most advantageous. It doesn't say you appoint the tenderer that is scored the highest in the evaluation criteria. So it is a judgment call. Um, you need to be able to justify the position that you are taking. But it is a it is a valid judgment call. But again, as I said, you have to weigh that up against the other criteria that might have been about quality or performance, etc., and, and um, how well the savings might offset the potential implications of quality downturn or delays in service delivery, etc. And that's something that only council can do or is that something that the tender panel can do themselves as well? The, the decision, um, the appointment decision is a council decision or, or, a, or a delegated decision so that's the point where it can, um, where, where, that, where that decision is made. Certainly a panel could make a recommendation. So hypothetically, a te the tender panel in this case could have recommended option two over option one because they felt it was best value and then justify it? Through the chair if they thought that was um, the most advantageous. Sorry about this, folks. Um, so through the chair to the Acting Director of Technical Services, um, was any consideration done to, uh, to look at those top ones to consider if option one, two or three, which of those was the most advantageous to the City of Vincent, rather than, I mean, a lot of it talks to the, the, the scoring side of things? Uh, through the Mayor, just to clarify, we're talking about the rankings one, two and three as opposed to options one, two and three. Well, through the, through the Mayor, we certainly obviously looked in detail at the top three, and that was the purpose of 
uh, calling the top three back to, to have a more detailed assessment of them. And then the uh, tender panel assessed that the DEVCO, while not the cheapest, but certainly the best, uh, most advantageous for the city. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Uh, questions through you, perhaps to the CEO or perhaps to the Acting Director. Um, given the obvious attraction, uh, given the number of tenderers, um, is there any p particular reason why it needed to be over a three-year period? I understand the process is involved both for us and for the tenderers, but given the nature of the work uh, and the, I suppose, uh, transient and changing nature of it, you would assume, uh, was, was, was there was there any particular reason why we did three years, one year, two years, five years? I understand there's another year at our sole discretion, but is that industry standard? Is that what's expected because of the level of work involved in assessing the tender or preparing it? So if we can just get some information around that, please. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, that question relates to the specification design in the first instance. I'll have to get the Acting Director to answer that. Yeah, through the Mayor, that in the local government, that is the industry standard of the three-year tender. Councillor Toppelberg, anything further? No. Councillor Buckles. Just, uh, just a little follow-up from what I was on about before. It would just be good to have some information for the next meeting through you, Chair. Um, just regarding the $608,000 annual bill, it would be, I'd be interested to know what the break-up is between hourly rate versus consumables that, are, that is awarded under the contract, because I just note that if it is at a significant proportion is for materials rather than hourly rate. Um, I, mean, I don't know how big the jobs are that, that come under this. Um, I just note that we, it's only assessed based upon the hourly rates, not the margins and provision of materials. I don't know if we go and then we just assume, because you're, you're obviously not going out for three quotes, which is what would often happen in local government if you were making a purchase of whatever amount. So I'm, I'm, I'm just interested to know how we assess the um, the the the, uh, the price of the materials and the other other bits, given that that might be a significant component to this project. Jeez. Uh, through the mayor, uh, look, I will take that notice and we'll do some uh, analysis of our assessment. But it's, we we how we tend to um, or how we do assess these is we run various scenarios of different jobs we've done in the past 12 months, and actually model those, and then compare the top three make sure that we're getting value for money. So that's inclusive of the material costs. Councillor Harley. Through you, Chair. I'm just, um, I know we're on um, 6.2, but I'm looking across at 6.3 and 6.4, and it goes back to my question earlier. So I just want to seek some clarification. Um, if that could be on notice, that's fine. Um, 6.2 refers to a total spend of 608000 for provision of services, electrical, serv uh, plumbing, gas and some maintenance services. 6.3 refers to 236000 just for the one company, which is for plumbing and gas. And then 6.4 refers to 594000 for electrical, which makes a total, if I'm not wrong, of about 800 Eight hundred and thirty thousand um, dollars. I'm not understanding the link with the first one. So we've got six hundred and eight thousand mentioned in six point two, and then between the next two tender items, it's eight hundred and thirty thousand dollars. And so I'm asking this um, through your chair to the CEO because just while I was in the chair. Um, the CEO wrote a note saying it was the combined total, but I don't think it is. So could I put that on notice and have a bit of a... Um, some more information? Yeah. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, apologies, Councillor Harley. Just as a point of clarification, the Director may wish to elaborate on this further. The, the explanation that um, administration has attempted to provide in the first paragraph of the background section of item 6.2 to 6.3 and 6.4 is that um, in the past there was a single tender that provided for 
the small maintenance services, electrical services and plumbing and gas fitting services. And the, uh, in relation to item 6.2, the report explains that 608,000 related just to small maintenance services. So that was my uh, misreading of that, apologies. Uh, as Councillor Harley has rightly pointed out then, uh, six point, um, item 6.3, plumbing and gas was 236,000 in the last financial year and electrical services was 594. So in total, that relate or that has summed to $1.438 million in the last financial year related to electrical, plumbing and gas fitting and maintenance services. So administration will identify how we can provide more detailed back, um, breakdown for those expenditure items that have summed to those totals. So are you able to also, if it can't be answered tonight, put it on notice about where else then Walsh is handyman and Sam, Sam, the maintenance man, I can't remember his name, but it's the one I've been banging on about for three years, where they fit in and what tender they belong to, because they also do maintenance work. So we've got a lot of people doing maintenance work. Uh, we're paying out a lot of money, basically. And the question was asked a number of years ago about whether we'd be just be better off employing our own maintenance men. And the answer was no, but looking at these figures, I don't know if that's a question I should put on notice again. So are you able to let me know where all of the other maintenance and handyman costs are being met through? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, I know that the question has been asked before. I'm quite confident the administration has responded through various briefing notes, but I'll also just ask the Acting Director to clarify the relationship with those other contractors you've mentioned in these tenders. Uh, through the Mayor, while Sam's business name incorporates the word maintenance, he doesn't actually do maintenance for us. He actually His tender is uh, installation of signs and sign poles and... and that's his trading name, his maintenance, but he doesn't actually do our maintenance. There's Walshies and Sam, Sam the maintenance man, who doesn't do maintenance. Uh, through the Mayor, um, Walshy, Walshies all around tradesman doesn't currently have a, a tender, from my understanding. He's getting paid. That's correct, yeah. So he's engaged on a casual basis by quoting. Okay, thanks. We're still on the first tender, which is provision of small maintenance services. Are we ready to move on to the next, or is there any further questions on this one? Great, we'll move on to 6.3, which is the tender for plumbing and gas services. Are there any questions in relation to this item? No? Okay. Yes, I, I guess Michaels. just things that I've raised are similar uh, that's with Councillor Harley are consistent. So, so if we're providing any information, it would be useful to get it across the, all, the three. Jesus. Yes, I do um, understand that a lot of the questions that have been asked are relevant to all three of the tenders. Um, are there any specific questions in relation to tender 6.4, which is in relation to um, electrical services? No, okay. Um, and just to note also that tender six, um, item number 6.5, which is a tender for the supply and laying of asphalt, is um, going to be provided as part of the council agenda to be published this Friday. Um, moving on to corporate services. The first item is item 7.1, termination of lease and options for future use, 245 Vincent Street, Leaderville. Are there any questions? Councillor Loden and then Councillor Murphy. Uh, just one quick one. The report talks about uh, this being considered as part of the asset utilisation. There's a report, a workshop coming back to council in February, a report coming back in February, I believe. So this will be included as part of that reporting back? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, whilst uh, a number of the lease buildings will be referred to within that report, uh, it's, it's unlikely that the administration will be able to provide much data from an occupancy basis. Um, we get limited data from lessees about how they're actually using the buildings. So uh, certainly we'll be providing occupancy data for all of the buildings that the city manages and we're now keeping a very good track of that occupancy data. Um, from a lease perspective, for the most part, it will be whether the building is leased and occupied or um, not occupied. Any further questions, Councillor Hallett? Sorry, sorry, I apologise. I did go to Councillor Murphy first. I'll go to Councillor Murphy and then Councillor Hallett. Sorry about that, Councillor Murphy. 
No problem. Um, I did uh, want to ask a question through the chair, <clears throat> if it would be possible at all to look at uh, expressions of interest for sale in addition to um, residential lease, if that was something that the city would consider or could consider? Um, so through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the short answer to that is yes. Um, the, the first item of business that Council is being asked to consider as part of this report <coughs> Excuse me, is to approve or not the mutual agreement to terminate the lease. Um, beyond that, it's Council's prerogative to decide what to do with the property. Um, the, there are a number of options identified in the report for the immediate disposition or use of that property, whether through lease or sale. Um, over and above that, uh, Council may choose to uh, approve the advertising or the call for expressions of interest for the um, sale or lease of the property. Um, if Council were to choose that particular path, then all that would happen in terms of the outcome would be firstly to um, finalise the termination of the lease with the current lessee and secondly for administration to advertise and call for expressions of interest for the lease or sale, uh, sorry, lease or acquisition of that property and then once that expression of interest period is, is closed, administration would bring a report to Council to make a determination on which path to take, which would then lead to uh, any of the options that are identified in the report already. Thank you. Um, just carrying on, I guess, from Councillor Loden's um, query or connection of this to the broader asset um, review. Has, in terms of the community expressions of interest potential for this um, location, um, is it possible to look at opportunities around emergency food relief or um, emergency accommodation, if not for this location, but also as part of the asset review of other locations, whether there's scope for, um, I guess, that community input? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, if, if that was certainly a, a, a use that Council would want to see from any of our existing building stock, that is something that administration could pursue, but certainly our priorities at the moment are trying to get maximum use of our existing buildings and consolidating user groups where we can and, and trying to get a, a good understanding of how our buildings are currently being utilised. So it isn't something that administration is pursuing at the moment, but if uh, Council wishes us to look at that sort of use for our lease buildings as, as a vacancy becomes available, then that's something administration could pursue. Any further questions? Okay, moving on to item 7.2, financial statements as at the 31st of July 2017. Are there any questions? No, moving on to 7.3, authorisation of expenditure for 29th of July to 23rd August 2017. Moving on to item 7.4, investment report as at 31st of August 2017. Councillor Loden. Just wanted to confirm that a review of the investment policy is coming to a council workshop in October. Uh, yes, I can confirm that is the case. Any further questions? Okay, moving on to uh, item 7.5, Standing Orders Amendment Local Law 2017. Do we have any questions? I have some questions. Um, I guess I direct these to the Manager of Governance Services. Um, in relation to um, removing the requirement to state address but to state the suburb of residence, I wonder, and feel free to take these on notice, I'll go through them all, I wonder whether we could also add um, suburb of residence or business location, given that some people that come to talk to us at council meetings are ratepayers who are business owners in the vicinity. Um, in relation to um, item, um, part 2.19 of the standing orders, which is relevant to questions, part one states a member, meaning a council member, seeking to ask a question of council, which is an interesting concept. I guess that would be to the presiding member. 
um, shall provide written notice to the CEO of four working days. Can I just get some clarification around that particular part of the standing orders and um, where, what sort of circumstances that may arise? Um, in relation to part 7.12, it talks about motions being deferred, um, but they cannot be deferred in respect of the election of a presiding member. And I just wondered in what circumstances would the, the council be required to elect a presiding member? Um, I think the standing orders talk about if the deputy mayor isn't present, then there is a discussion amongst council me members prior to nominate not to elect, so that might need to change. Um, in relation to 9.8, I'm just raising this, 9.81 talks about a councillor and just in terms of the language throughout this, the standing orders talks about members and that just seemed to be a bit of an anomaly. Um, and again, when talking about council briefings, that new section talks about elected members and members of the public, whereas the language of the standing orders is members and persons. Um, I just wanted to also ask whether we need to state in that new section 12.9 on council briefings whether the questions, whether um, members of the public can ask questions and make statements during public question time um, that are relevant to the agenda. And I think it also needs to stipulate that it's during public question time because we do occasionally have members of the public that think that it's an interactive question and answer throughout the meeting. So just to clarify that. Um, that was all from me. Are there any further questions in relation to this item? Councillor Harley? Um, I've got, I'm going to put a couple in, um, in my, it's very, there's a lot here, um, but I just <clears throat> wanted to double check about 9.8, which is to do with continued breach of order, because it does talk about councillors and it talks about persons or members, but can I just cl get clarification that this, a number of these points could also apply to staff in terms of behaviours in the, not that we've ever had a problem, but you never know. That can the presiding member, in this case the mayor, call a staff member to order and can there be can um, through you, Mayor Cole, clause nine point eight bracket two of the standing orders to which Councillor Harley is re uh, referring doesn't distinguish between a staff member, a member of the public or otherwise, so uh, yes, there would be no doubt. But um, yes, I would also hope and expect that issue to never arise. <laughs> Councillor Harley, do you have further questions? <laughs> Craig's in the hot seat. <laughs> uh, any further questions on standing orders? Okay, we'll move on to um, review of policy in relation to council meetings, recording and web streaming, item 7.6. Any questions? Um, okay, I did have uh, two questions. The first is in relation, well they're both in relation to the policy. Um, the first question is it does talk about provision of, of a transcript and I think I know the answer to this question. Are we still required to provide transcript because I guess not everyone would necessarily have access to a, a web streaming or potentially computer? Is that, is that the answer? That we need to remain accessible and provide transcripts to those who can't access online bookmarked um, recordings? So the Mayor, um, there is no requirement for us to provide a transcript of, um, of proceedings. Uh, uh, certainly our discipline, uh, our DAPE um, would state that we would provide it in alternative formats in any case regardless of what this policy says. Um, so there is potential that it may be redundant here. However, um, it's useful that we currently have a fee and charge in place for the provision of this transcript if somebody would like it. Um, however, 
Having said that, if it was for disability purposes, we probably wouldn't apply it. So I am struggling to think of a reason why we would provide a transcript other than for disability purposes. Potentially for, say, seniors or others that don't have access to a computer, but um, perhaps we could just give some consideration into transcript being provided um, was previously because we didn't have online web streaming, but whether we actually just need to look at that a little bit close, more closely before next week's meeting just to consider alternative forms of provision of that information and whether um, requesting payment for transcript is is appropriate or whether it needs to be looked at from a DAPE and also seniors and other perspectives of people who aren't using um, computers. Um, my other question was in relation to um, previously um, put forward was the idea of copywriting the information um, provided during through web streaming, but I didn't see that reflected in the policy. Um, could you provide some commentary on that issue? Sure. Um, the way that copyright works is that uh, copyright is applied automatically when um, when a person produces a work, uh, which this would be considered. Um, so there is nothing else for council to do to claim that copyright. It just is copyrighted. Uh, notwithstanding, um, we will put a note on the web page to say, just to reaffirm to everyone that this uh, is copyrighted and that council would very much seek to protect its copyright against any infringement. Councillor Tuppelberg. Thank you. Can I just flag an amendment that I'd seek to have that included in the policy? I think that it should be just that the, the, the without just something that says that without the express permission of the city that uh, uh, rebroadcast publication of any of the material, digital or otherwise, is, is not permitted. I think it's important that we're upfront about that, certainly in the initial stages of taking this step. Thank you, Councillor Tuppelberg. Any other questions? Okay, moving on. We are no items. Sorry, sorry. Just yes. before we do, sorry, Madam Chair. Um, just going back to the questions in relation to the transcript. Um, would it not be prudent to just have a catch-all at the end that say that uh, uh, where there are issues of accessibility, like where, where, where need is demonstrated, or, or otherwise, that uh, alter, you know, alternative there are alternative ways available, or something like that, rather than mentioning it, not mentioning it, having a yes. fee, or otherwise, just I, to. I, I think that would be a good way yep. forward to have some alternate words in time for next Tuesday's meeting, if possible. Um, yes. Okay, we are going to um, move through community engagement very briefly this evening and land at the Chief Executive Officer at 9.1, which is the information bulletin. The last item for the evening. Are there any questions in relation to the info bulletin? Councillor Loden. Uh, question through the Mayor to the Director of Development Services, just around the Development Services Summary. Um, we received 46 applications and determined 25, um, which to me sounds like going in the wrong direction. So I just wanted to clarify if um, we do have the adequate resources to manage the volume of applications we're getting. Uh, yes, through the Mayor. We had a number of contractors um, who finished up with the City um, in in the last month um, and we'll have all the new staff on board on Monday, the last few staff. So we've had a few staff start. <laughs> Unfortunately we had another contractor um, resign yesterday so they have, they'll be here for another month. But um, So we will have everyone on board um, in the month of October, oh, I won't be here for part of for all of October so yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we, we were down on resources for, for last month. Um, we've also been working to deal with the backlog of applications. Um, and you'll see some of the time frames are quite um, extensive because there were some applications that have been with the city for a number of years. And we're working through those to try and um, get rid of the 2015, 2016 applications out of the system and that will affect the time frames um, as well. So it's been a challenge to do that. but we will have everyone on board, all the permit staff will be in place on Monday. Councillor Loden. Um, through the Chair on 9.1.13 around um, the review of DAPS was one of the, the motions. I think there was a letter that got sent in August. So I was just wondering um, what, if we've had any feedback or engagement from um, our uh, 
the local, the, mem the Minister for Local Government, I think it is. Um, through the Mayor, I think it was the uh, that was to the Minister for Planning. Um, the Minister's obviously cha I think it changed, the Minister's changed twice um, in that period, so there's been two sets of letters and we now need to do the same with the, with the new Minister, um, which we, we haven't done yet, so we now need to um, pursue that again um, given the, um, some of the other matters that are before the Minister for Planning, we've been concentrating on the scheme and concrete batching plant, etc. So um, we've deliberately held off on that for the time being, but we will be pursuing that shortly. I can help with that one. Um, I haven't formally written to the Minister for Planning on our position on development assessment panels. I did flag with her in a meeting um, that we attended her office to discuss our town planning draft local planning scheme too, that um, it's an area of great interest and importance to the city and that we would be most um, keen to discuss the issues and provide our experience and um, um, views to her, um, but yes, that's correct, uh, develop, uh, Director, the most recent letters have all pretty much been in relation to our scheme and the concrete batching plants, and the, um, the update there is that the meeting took place with, um, with Minister Ben Wyatt, who is now dealing with our scheme, and that uh, Minister Safiotti most recently wrote back to confirm that she will be calling in the concrete batching plants um, the applications that are before the SAT at the moment, given that she doesn't have a conflict there and can still determine those. So we have one minister dealing with our concrete batching plants and one minister dealing with our local planning scheme. Neither are, are yet resolved. Any further questions in relation to the info bulletin? No, okay, I'll declare the meeting closed at 8.24pm. Thank you, everyone.